Hello, folks. Mark Farashi with ProTech Dog Training. Tonight, we've got a special show. We're going to do a live show from YouTube. We're streaming now to YouTube. And if you're in the YouTube uh, section watching this, you have the comments. You guys can make comments and, and uh, questions, etc. We'll be pulling those in towards the end of the broadcast and let you guys be participating in the show. Get some questions in and uh, maybe learn a few things from what you've got to feel to us. But the way this is going to work, first off, I'm going to go ahead and do a little intro and, and, and read it, and then I will introduce my guest uh, one at a time into the show, and I'll pull them into the show here. So let me get going here. Title of the show is Working with Dangerous Dogs in the Industry. Dealing with dangerous dogs and misplaced aggression in dogs, is especially in the training business, can be tricky. In today's dog world, we have many trainers and professionals that deal with dogs that could be considered dangerous, rescue organizations that are taking them in, etc. As professionals, we need to have a little more insight when dealing with these sorts of dogs in the profession. Over the past few months, I've seen two bike mauling incidents posted online where professionals or those that deal with rescues and dominant dog situations have gone sideways. This has gotten my juices to flow, making me want to address the topic further. For me, it is something I deal with all the time. Though I don't consider myself an expert in this area or someone that wants to say I specialize in this area of expertise, as a professional, it's something I'm pretty familiar with. I deal with it in my business offerings to my customers. Reactive dogs, fear aggression, dominant aggression, etc. It's something we all deal with from time to time as professionals. The bite situations with these two cases, though, was extreme. Not just your everyday dog bite situation. They were both situations that caused major bodily harm to the dog care providers or the professionals that they could have very well have ended up with death as the end result. In today's show, we're going to address the subject of dog aggression and delve into the subject a little deeper with my two guests. Leah Jinduso with Andromeda Canine is one of his trainers that just got nailed by a dog she was working with and suffered some pretty horrific injuries. We'll talk about that with her as she's entered the show here. I'm sure that a lot of you probably saw the pictures online. They're pretty graphic. This was more of a mulling than any dog bite situation. The young lady's lucky to be alive. If you've seen those pictures, you know what I'm talking about. It's pretty, pretty horrific, as I said. With this and the fact that she's well-versed as a professional trainer to deal with cases like this, I want to have her on the show so she can give us a first-hand description of what happened to her and help us delve into the subject a little further. Needless to say, this isn't her first rodeo. She, again, is well qualified to be taking on aggressive dogs like cases like this. We'll get to know Leah a little better as we dig into the show. My second guest is Ted Bel Belmire with Useless Dog Training in Menifee, California, who is a professional trainer that deals with working dogs for the most part, but he also does a full range of pet dog training and behavior issues. While running his boarding and doggy daycare center in Menifee, California, called Useless Dogs. I've come to know and respect Ted as a knowledgeable professional trainer that I go to often working with my dogs. Just so you know, Ted has a secret he's keeping from the general public, and I've already pretty much told you the secret. This is one of those reasons he's on the show today. He doesn't talk about it all that much, but he specializes in dealing with dog aggression cases. These are dogs and dog customers that a lot of the time are referred to them through their local vets in his area or through word of mouth in the dog training community. Ted's the one I come... Ted's the one I had come to help me with Arrow, my rank dominant male Dutch Shepherd when I first got him. You've probably seen this dog in a few of my videos. So today we're going to have a discussion with Ted and my special guest Leah, I'm Jim Duso. Leah is a professional that deals with, with aggression issues on a regular basis. This is not her first rodeo, as they say. In this discussion, we were going over the different types of aggression along with hows and whys that aggression manifests in dogs. We'll also be talking about a myriad of other topics related to the industry and what's going on in today's society regarding dangerous dogs when it comes to rescue, aggressive dogs, animal control, and topics along these lines. It's something that you as a professional need to be aware of if you're going to start adding this expertise to your portfolio. So let me go ahead and pull Leah in. Leah, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? How are you feeling? I'm good. I'm still going through a substantial healing process. I obviously have a full arm cast still. And, um, you know, I have multiple stitches and puncture marks on my face. Um, I did put a little makeup on to, like, kind of deter the whole black eye thing going on. But um, 
other than that, I'm I'm good. I'm surprisingly healing better than I even expected I could. Very cool. Um, I want to get into a few of the, the topics and kind of open the ball with you a little bit, and then we'll pull Ted into the room as well. Uh, let me get my stuff up here. Um, one of the subjects we've been talking about as we practice for this is dog aggression and what types and forms there are. So there's a bunch of different ones that we have, and I wanted to kind of get you to kind of go over a few of them and, and explain them to, to the audience so they get to learn a little bit. For sure. So a lot of people think aggression with dogs is just a one type of situation, and it's a complementary of one thing. And people need to be educated on the fact that there is a substantial amount of reasons why a dog can be aggressive. You know, there can be components such as fear aggression. Dominance aggression is a huge thing. 90% of intact males that I get are usually dominant aggressive for that reason. Um, you know, there's crate aggression, there's food aggression, boy aggression, you know, which is usually also called resource guarding, whether it be via food or um, toys. You know, there's there's anxiety that can actually cause a play into aggression. There's just so many different components that nobody actually knows that are normal things that we as trainers actually look at. So, um, you know, I'd like to for us to break it down and actually be able to go through everything and have people more understand and be educated what dog aggression really is and what actually are the reasons for it. Right. In regards to the dog that you work, can you talk about the breed that that happened with and a little bit about that situation so we can kind of describe what happened to you? So first and foremostly, it's, it's, it's funny because when I posted my story and all the pictures, which were extremely graphic, um, I thought about it when I was in the hospital that what should I do? Should I post this or should I not? And as a former state police um, canine handler and being a trainer and being in dogs for 20 years, I thought about it and I'm like, you know what? Fuck this. Like, I think that people need to be educated on this. And as a trainer, if I hide this, I'm hiding something that was something that almost took my life. You know what I mean? So it's like, I'd rather be honest and open and actually have people understand what happened and talk about it rather than be, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of trainers and rescuers and people, as you know, in society these days that they want to talk about all the positives and the, oh, we did this and we did that and we saved this dog and we saved this dog. The underlying fact is, is there is a very dark topic that a lot of people don't speak about, which is when dogs go wrong and when they attack and they have to be euthanized or whatever situation is. A lot of people don't talk about the failures. It's all about the success rates. And I'm one of those people, I'm honest, I'm an open book, and I would rather put it out on the table and tell you the stories of not just the good, but also the bad to reiterate that shit happens. And sometimes things can go wrong and it's a almost tragic, fatal event. And so this situation, I, uh, great example I take a lot of these days. So I train dogs on my own, but for the last 17 years I've been working with dogs and a lot of times I now, because I got bored and I, I've done working dogs for so many years, I take on severe aggressive cases and normally I have a very good success rate and 2020 has not been a good year for me. <laughs> so I've just had two back to back situations where I had two failures and I'm more than happy to talk about it because not only do I want to learn more on my behalf, but I want other people to be, to be educated as well. So. It was an owner surrender Dogo, Dogo Argentino, which is a lot of people are not familiar with. They're a Argentinian Mastiff. So they're usually around 100 pounds to 130 pounds, and they're bred to hunt. So they're basically bred to go at the whatever they're hunting at their prey at their neck. Um, they usually specifically are used for wild boar hunting, which wild boars can be 500 pounds plus. And in Africa, they're also known to hunt um, legit panthers and, and lions and things of that nature. So they're very strong dogs. They're genetically made to be extremely aggressive, you know, and they're not a breed for everybody. So when I took this dog on in 17 years working with dogs, I've never had a dogo. So I was like, yeah, I'm up for the challenge. Like the plate in my arm is finally like good to go after the last time I get bit. So I'm like, all right, whatever. Picked up this dog. I got all the information from the owner. And unfortunately, another you know thing we're going to talk about is a lot of times owners or rescues or anybody else that's surrendering a dog to a canine trainer, they kind of 
band-aid the situation. So I was told the the wife um, was scared of this dog. There was um, aggression shown at the dog for growling, and she claimed that he lunged at her at one point, but there was no bites. They said specifically the dog's never bit anybody. Um, backtracking now and looking at everything, I know there's no way in hell that this dog didn't bite somebody before. There's 110%. I'd be willing to bet my house if this dog attacks somebody the way he attacked me. So I picked up the dog. He's awesome. I, I have him for a few weeks. We worked so hard on training after we first established a bond. He was doing all off-leash obedience with me, healing down to a tease, center healing. I mean, downstays, everything, hand signals. You name it, this dog was doing so well, and I liked him so much. He was a big goofball. And I'm like, you know what? I might take him and keep him for myself title him in PSA and make him my own demo dog. You know, it's it's a very, it's one of those breeds that I really respect because they have just so much. They have such a command presence and they just, they're, they're gorgeous. You know what I mean? Yeah. But the fact that he was also doing so well with me, I'm like, he's staying with me, good to go. So uh, two weeks ago, come tomorrow, it was the morning and I was getting ready and getting my homemade sangria ready for golf. And I was so excited because tea time was 1.45. And, uh, I'm putting away dishes and I had my other dogs away and I had the dog go out and uh, he's sitting organically next to me, which I get a lot of flack on for that word, mind you, organic. 90% of the people that saw my posts online were amazing. The other 10% chewed me apart for the stupidest shit in the world. And they're like, what's an organic oh, sit? That's not, a, that's not a thing in the training world. I'm like, guys, are you fucking serious? It's literally a natural sit. I'm like, do I even have to like specify this? It's a natural sit. Right. That is all. It's not some sort of training, high speed training thing. I'm like, you guys are really picking this apart. Back to so, the, uh, next to the counter, right? And just was relaxed and sat You can't make this shit up. Yeah. You can't. So um, he's sitting naturally next to me. So I'm putting dishes away. And as I'm putting a dish away, he growled. And I looked and I was like, Enzo. And right when I looked at him, I could see it in his eyes. Um, as you know, if you, you worked with aggression dogs like they have a change in demeanor but they also have a change of look in their eyes and I can't explain it but right when I saw that I was like shit I one second later face which I have stitches I don't know if you can see but it's literally stitches but, from here to here he hits you there first right into your neck huh he grabbed me first and he went to go for my neck so when he did that I gave him an elbow strike he went to get this side of my neck but when he did that, I also need him at the same time. So he just did a quick puncture right there, but didn't do the aggressive rip that was off. I My cheek was basically, yeah. it was that much exposed. So it was a fight of my life at this point because I, I realized I've been in situations before when I'm getting bit. For example, I had a hundred pound Belgian Malinois here. He bit out of fear aggression. I knew that. So at the situation when he grabbed my arm, I looked around and I'm like, what can I do? And there was two metal bowls next to me on, on the kitchen sink. So I went to grab those bowls. He let go of me, redirected on my left, and I took the bowls on my right and smashed them to the ground. Right. He let go, looked, and I'm like, all right, buddy, let's go outside. And uh, little did I know that my ulna was protruding out of my arm, but I'm like, all right, fear aggression's one thing. This dog, if I threw something in the ground, there's no way in hell he was going to stop. He was just fighting to, to kill. You know, he was, it was full on dominance aggression mode, and it was a full on attack. So, all I thought about at that time is I have to get this dog contained or else I'm going to get killed. You know, if I lost my footing on the ground, I'm dead. If he got literally the doctors told me an inch lower, I would have bled out before he, I could call 911. Yeah. So I kept walking toward the dog room and I kept hitting him as hard as I could. He went at my neck again. I put my arm up and that's why I have chunks missing out of my arm. And I finally got him into the dog room. He went to lunge again and I grabbed a empty cardboard box that had dog food in it, pretended to throw it at him. He jumped back and I was able to run out and shut the door. So that was my situation. And I thought about it literally 17 million times of what I did wrong. And the problem with Dogos is they're an amazing breed. They do not show very much of a, a tick of what's going on. They don't show signs. It's a lot of dogs, you can see signs. They start growling, then they show the lip, or they, the hair goes up. This was a very quick, very small growl, That's and cool. I just looked at him, and it just Boom. time to fight, you know. Yeah. So, so we'll go back into that subject a little later in the show and talk about what, what happened with him and, and, and you. But 
bottom line, you're a badass, Phil. Your whole reaction, most people would be traumatized and be fearful and be showing that fear. And you're something else. I got a lot of respect for you. And then to find out. Yeah, I think it's a lot. Behind you was really cool. That's why I wanted you on the show. So. And I think it's a lot to do with the state police and like the things that I went through in my events. And like I said, this isn't my first, you said it before, this isn't my first rodeo. I have bites. I've been bit before. I can't, like I said, I have a metal plate in this arm. Yeah. Thank God it's not my right. But, you know, it's it's just one of those things. You have to stay calm. You know, and if you don't stay calm, it's going to get worse. Yeah, so you got to be able to think. Exactly. All I right. was more pissed. I was I was missing golf. So, <laughs> so I want to get into the subject a little bit more as far as the types of aggression and be a little more educational with it. That story is just towering. Anybody that's a dog trainer professional can relate really heavy. But let me go ahead and pull Ted into the room. We'll get him started in the conversation. What we're going to do is we're going to kind of just do an informal round table, and then we're going to bring in the, the crowd from the comments and, and ask questions, that sort of thing, and just. Have a good time and enjoy ourselves because it's a good day. We're above ground. <laughs> Ted, how you doing, buddy? Good. How you doing, Mark? We're doing good. For you, those Leah, of you how you doing? Who don't know Ted. I ah. gave kind of a. There you go. Sorry about that, guys. I gave a little intro on Ted in my write-ups, and let me find out if I've got something here to kind of intro Ted and what his experiences is, but. It's, it's pretty much, he, he's uh, a working dog trainer that I met a few years ago out doing uh, Schutzen, which is now called IGP. And that's how I got to know Ted with one of my dogs that came to me as a puppy and I wanted to find a good decoy. And I went out and found Ted. And I've come to have a lot of respect for him because he's a very humble, easygoing guy and he knows, he knows his, his job. And so that's really cool. But one of the things you may not know about Ted, and I said it in a little write up, is that he's pretty good with the aggressive dog. So. In that regards, Ted, what kind of cases do you get on a general sense, and where do they come from? Do they come from animal reds? Do they come from referrals? What's your most common case? I get a lot of referrals from all different areas. I get uh, referrals from vets. I get referrals from the shelters. I get referrals from rescues. Um, your regular pet owners come in um, looking to help with their dog aggression. Um, you know, pretty much anywhere there's dogs, there's dog aggression. So Very true. I, uh, I, uh, get referrals from all over the place. Most of it is manifested from people's uh, lack of knowledge. And, um, I hate using the word, but at the same time I do all the time ignorance. It's not a word that I want to say is, um, is, uh, demeaning. It's a word that in my world means that you don't know. And, and everybody starts out that way. We all do. We all have to learn and grow. So that's kind of why I wanted to do this show. So um, back to our mainline subject of, of aggression and what causes aggression and what types of aggression are there. I think the most common that I can think of is reactivity. And reactivity is caused by certain things that people do with their dogs that are raising them. But what would be some of the main things that you would think cause reactivity? So reactivity can be caused by many different things. Um, I see a lot of dogs that are reactive because just the fact that their owners are not good leaders you know they don't uh show them they're in control situations um you know they send signals to their dogs unknowingly that they're uh, that trigger behavior in their dogs and most people are totally oblivious to that this is going on um you know also like you know these dogs that are attacking people for reals uh, most most reactive dogs are just gonna give like a little bite something with like a fear aggression or something um, They're gonna bite and release the bites uh, The reason they're biting is to keep you away from them. They don't want you to engage um, So it's kind of like creating a safety bubble around them right. um, You know a dominant aggression a dominant aggression dog is much different like what Leah is dealing with um, But yeah, typically we're seeing a lot of that um, that fear aggression. The dominant aggression is completely different. The way you approach it is different. The way you manage it is different. Um, the actual danger to people is much more significant. Um, you know, if you can imagine, Leah is very capable as a young woman, like imagine a, a child or something. I'm not young. <laughs> well, imagine a child or something. 39 is not a... young. <laughs> But thanks. I'll Most take it. Give it <laughs> that. 
<laughs> you know, kids couldn't Sorry. couldn't defend themselves to this situation, and unfortunately, the way that society is right now, they're putting kids in danger with dogs that rescues are releasing that are that are extremely dangerous and you know one second with the wrong dog with a kid can affect them for life and so you know really mm -hmm. that's why i do what i do is is for those kids that are like you know living with parents that just don't know better you know and they love their dogs and maybe their dog you know needs some help or something right. and we you know so, All right, so what I want to do right now is kind of unpack the different types of aggression and be able to explain a little better for the, the general public that may not know about it. Reactivity, in a general sense, is a dog that's usually reacting on the end of the leash, maybe lunging at dogs, so that's dog reactivity, or maybe lunging at people. That behavior usually comes from fear and from trying to, like Ted said, drive that bubble back, try to drive that away from them. So that is usually the most common type of aggression that you see that most customers that I have anyway come to me in regards to the reactivity. The dominant aggression and other types of aggressions are not as, as um, prevalent, but they are there depending on what causes them, like what happened with Leah. Um, and we'll get into some of that as we go along as well. So um, reactivity, there's a certain way that I deal with it. I'm sure that each one of you have a certain way of... Um, solving that problem. Maybe we'll get into that subject later and kind of talk about that. I've got a whole little lecture format that I talked about where I talk about uh, floating the bubble, where I, a dog's threshold is a certain bubble around the dog, and then that outside dog has got his own bubble too, because he may be reactive and, and getting some stimulus to the other dog. And it's what I do to float that bubble to keep the dog from that threshold. But we'll talk about that real maybe in another show. Um, Fear aggression, what kind of things would be, would that kind of be reactivity, but what other things would manifest in that area, Leah, that you would see in fear aggression? I see like, I, I feel like I see fear aggression the most out of anything, um, you know, and it, it's especially prevalent in rescue dogs for whatever situation occurred when they were with the owner. And then obviously a lot of it also plays effect when they're in somewhere like a New York Animal Control, you know, where they, they smell the fear of death and they, they see the other dogs and they're in a place where they're just so uncomfortable that they literally just basically break down and shut down, you know, and just become that dog. So there's two different things I see in, in rescues as far as like animal control dogs and everything else. Either one, they come out of it and they're a 100% different dog when they're super aggressive in a kennel situation inside of a shelter. Um, or it's the exact opposite 180 where they are super nice because they're not in their environment and they're not comfortable in a rescue or shelter situation. And then you get them home and you start working with them at your kennel or wherever the place may be. And I like to call it the honeymoon phase is over. And then they become comfortable in their environment and then show their true colors, you know? So it kind of goes either way, but I feel like fear aggression, there's so many different substances to fear aggression. There's dog versus dog, you know, and that's a lot of times as trainers, we deal with that more than anything, you know, man's walking dog on leash, dog with other, man with other dog is coming by, and next thing you know, it's a shit show, so the dog's freaking out, I have a friend that has a cane corso, and I told him everything to do, and I, I worked with the dog, and she was great with me, but he'd give her a correction on the prong, or use the e-collar, and she'd get so fired up, she'd turn around and re redirect the bite on him, you know, out of frustration, like, I can't get this dog, I want to kill it, I'm just gonna bite you. You know what I mean? It's just, oh. I see that a lot. Ted, what do you think? Yeah, I think the same thing. I, I see the same stuff happening. Um, I have a, a lot, like I deal with a, a large client base of private clients that aren't from rescues, but uh, you know, and most of the stuff that I'm seeing with them is just like, you know, they have a little dog that's attacking their hands or something when they, they go to pick it up or, you know, a lot of resource guarding and stuff like that, that is stemming from fear initially, you know, like right. maybe they're, they're resource guarding their crate, you know, which is, is coming from that need for security, that need for having their own safe space. Right. And then it's causing them to try and again, create a safety bubble around them to get people away from them. It's very natural for a dog to have a boundary aggression where he's hitting the fences, anybody walks by, that kind of thing. It seems to me the crate is very similar to that, but I can see how you're relating to it being 
their area, so it turns into a resource. So resource gardening would be uh, maybe guarding their, their bowl of food or their area that they're in a kennel. Uh, Ted, you know this because you helped me with my Dutch Shepherd, but he was resource guarding on his owner for like two years, and she couldn't go anywhere without going out in the early, early morning or late at night. She was worried this dog was going to nail somebody, and he was serious about it. And there was it, it all kind of stems to, in my mind, in the area of improper relationship. So this dog was basically dominant in her world and very subtle, minute little ways that most people don't pick up on it. You or I, as a professional, we would pick up on this, but jumping up on the on the counter to counter surf, and then you walk over and you say, get off of there, and you're kind of chastising, you're not correcting the dog. So he's getting away with that behavior and he's playing a dominant role. So that relationship problem between her as the owner and the dog for two years and then letting him resource guard, like turned him into Superman. He thought he was God when he came to me. And but do you know what the problem with that is too? Is I'm he, sorry, I said the problem with that as well is the dog in his little pea brain understood that he was in charge. He's alpha. Yeah. You know what I, mean? yeah. I had a 135 pound Rottweiler here amazing with me never was on a prong collar before ACO called me and was like can you help with this dog he's literally terrifying everybody he was a complete asshole when I first got him not to me I put him on a prong collar and I'm like he gave me one growl I just ignored him like let's go screwball and uh he was awesome with me so this dog would get adopted out to a family that was like we've had dogs our whole entire life they've always been Rottweilers we were so brief savvy this and that I'm like all right cool I'd give him up and then the honeymoon stage, like I told you, he would come over and next thing you know, he's resource guarding all of his food, uh, all of his toys. He'd take, you know, toilet paper off the ground. They'd go to take it and he would just literally growl at them. They were scared shitless and he won. Every time he won. Exactly. He had zero respect for these humans where then finally I had a, um, a friend of mine, Lawrence, went there and did a whole session with them. And he took the dog by the prong and held him up for a second when he growled. And then he's like, all right, take it away from him again. And the dog looked at Lawrence and looked at the, the, the item and looked at him again and was like, let him take it. You know, it's all about respect with these dogs. And if they don't respect you, stand by, you know. I think the biggest thing that I, I, I noticed from you, and I want to kind of go along this so people understand, uh, that honeymoon period I call kennel shock. Meaning they come in and they're not sure of their new area. They're going to be a big sweetheart. Then they get accustomed to what's going on and they start going into their normal behavior traits that may be there, other behaviors that are already there. And I think you said earlier when we were talking, you were talking that no aggression comes without previous experience or some reason is, that is there. It's not a, a mystery why this stuff manifests. So Yeah, people always say there's such a thing called unprovoked aggression. And I spent a couple hours talking with another trainer, Josh Jacobson of Fearless Canine, and he's one of the best behavioral canine trainers I know. Like he literally will nitpick everything to a T and just like dissect everything that you're talking about. And he told right. me, he said, there's no such thing as unprovoked aggression. And I'm like, you know, yep. you know, there's always a trigger. There's always a trigger. So going along that whole subject line, how it is very important to, to have a bond uh, with the animal and get that established first before you start going and corrective measures as far as being a professional and trying to analyze the animal, get to know them and have them have some kind of trust. In my training programs, even with um, any dog, it doesn't matter what dog comes, I spend two or three days of no pressure whatsoever. And all I do is spend time with that dog and I build my bond first. And then from there, I start my training. So that's got to be the same thing with the aggression. So. Um, can we think of any other type of aggressions and, and where they come from or how they might manifest? Yeah. So, I want to mention something on the dominant aggression. Okay. Um, something that a lot of people don't think about, like uh, methods of training, uh, ways that people are addressing the dominant aggression. Um, I had a dog come to me and I had a lot of video of the dog and how it was being worked by another trainer. And the dog is a, a dog that didn't really want human interaction too much. Um, he was happy enough just kind of hanging out and being around. He didn't want to be pet. And the dog showed a lot of dominant aggression, like, like, you know, he was a pretty intense case. So um, I actually adopted the dog because nobody was going to be taking this dog home. So I kept the dog. <laughs> He's in my backyard. Um, so I've done yeah. that before. I'm like, you can't, you can't <laughs> adopt it out. So you see. Yeah, I'll keep the dog. So 
Anyway, this dog is a... Uh, one of the things that the guy was doing is like the dog would show him aggression. He had the dog on a catch pole for three and a half months, you know, and if you have a dog on a catch pole for that long, there's something going on, you know? So the, uh, I was watching videos and I could see that like the dog would show him aggression and he would turn his back to the dog and it's called a withholding, right? We're all familiar with that technique. Okay, but the problem is with a yeah. dominant dog, withholding, all you're doing is submitting to the dog. Exactly. In the dog's mind, that's a submission. You turning your back on them, and it just empowers the dog. And so, you have what? so many trainers that are that are taking these approaches, trying to address behavior through these obedience, these like positive obedience techniques and it's just not addressing what needs to be addressed exactly you know i had the dog within 24 hours i had the dog on a leash you know because you were no need the for yeah there's no need for a dog to have to spend that much time on a on a catch pole you know it's the dog's not getting Indeed. exercise right all you know all the above it's just with my male the, the dominant aggressive uh that shepherd that I've got, rank dominance. We'll talk about rank dominance in a bit. But um, the guys that were working him that she was sending this dog out to was trying to use a suit and, and be able to take bites. And, and they kept going in with the dog, trying to build bonding, always with a suit on. Don't you think a dog's smart enough to figure out that you've got a suit on? He has no respect for that. And so that was clear in my mind right away. You know, I understand you've got to be safe when you're dealing with some of this to try to get a dog to and from a place or whatever. But when you're trying to build bond and you're trying to establish that uh, relationship with the dog in a proper format, a suit to me just didn't make any sense. Uh, no, no. And I had a Dutch Shepherd that I told you about before from Florida. Um, this this guy called me and he's like, I can't keep this dog. I don't know what to do with it. Thankfully, I was already going to Florida. So I'm like, cool, I'll assess him in person. Met him in West Palm and... Um, he told me the story and he's like, this dog already mauled somebody. It was a rescuer that was like, oh, we'll take him. Put a prong collar on him immediately. Brought him to her friend's house. Gave him a correction. The dog looked at her and was like, fuck you. And just like literally went at her. She ran in the bathroom. She was pretty banged up. It's probably as bad as I am. And, um, you know, obviously gave the dog back and they wanted the dog euthanized. But it was a two-year-old Dutch Shepherd. We did the whole walk next to each other, exchange of the leash. And then all of a sudden, he was great with me. And he nudged my hands like to like pat him and i'm like okay we're friends cool so i had him flown back and long story short you know it he he's now in the department of corrections and he's one of the best baddest canines that they have there and god forbid if there's a riot in one of those jails because when he goes in god speaks to the inmates but you know it's just one of those situations where you don't you don't immediately correct a dog that you don't know exactly. it's just yeah. that's basically like like i used the analogy before a stranger walking up to a girl that's about to get in her car and he starts humping her leg. Like, what do you, what do you expect the person's going to do? You know what I mean? Like you have to take her on a date first. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you got to get friendly first. What the hell? <laughs> give her some time. Like, you know, so that, that's how I look at it, you know, but. All right. So let's go ahead and kind of go along a different track in, in, in general, as far as the industry is concerned. A lot of these dogs are coming to us from, um, rescues and that sort of thing is where we'll end up with these dogs. And in my mind, rescue a lot of times they're not as familiar with dog psychology because they don't deal with um, manipulating psychology and changing behaviors and all that. So when they do that, they should have a good assessment uh, type of uh, protocol to be able to ask the right questions. You were saying, Leah, that you really didn't know anything about the background of that animal. To me, that means that you're in danger because without that background to be able to understand where the dog's head's at and what it may have manifested some of this behavior, you're going in blind, you know? So, Ted. So, Mark, I will say in 17 years of doing this, I, I will honestly say I've never had a dog come at me the way this dog did, yes. you know? And, and with the background and knowledge that I have and what I mentioned before to you, in canine, for example, so you go through patrol school, you know, you – you have the dog hit the decoy several times. And one of my patrol schools that I was in with my first dog, we literally took newspapers and then fire hose and had we put the dog on our arm to try to get that real live bite feeling for the dog. You know, like obviously the the hidden sleeves and everything, but we wanted it more. And each dog, no matter what, I don't care what dog it is, ninety percent of them, the first bite on an apprehension of a suspect, 
sucks. It's a shitty bite. You're kind of embarrassed. You're like, oh, it's all my dog good. Like, oh my God. Because it's unnatural to the canine. It's not normal for a bite on a human being. They're right. not bred to do that. You know, they're genetically wound up to, to do working things and bite things, but they're not genetically wound up to say to, to bite a human. So with that being said, this dog that I had, the way that he came at me, I am fully convinced I will literally put my house on a, on a bet. This dog definitely bit somebody before. And it just wasn't, it wasn't told to me. And, you know, it, the dog could have killed me. It, let's, let's be honest. I mean, I, I'm, I'm okay with it. I understand it. You know, I'm a weirdo about it and I'm calm about that stuff. But like, if it was somebody else that didn't know what to do, the person would have been dead. You know, so same story. We're talking about stories. When I got that Dutch Shepherd, and he was rent dominant male, and I I had assessed it pretty much, but I really didn't understand it. I'd never dealt with one before. And I shell stab. He has a video out that I and he talked about it, so it made me clue into what the subject was all about. But this dog, all I did was in our building our relationship and everything. I let him out of the kennel, and he had a couple little spots that he would show his aggression. He would when you put him into the kennel, he would spin so fast and coming to me harder than I've ever had any dog come at me before. Really? Tougher than heck. And so then I realized... Did he bite you when you were going through a door? <laughs> yeah, you know, we'll get into some of the I'll tell you a little bit about this story. But So then I started... To, I knew that he was really ball happy. He was really crazy about the ball. So I went out in the backyard and I let him out of the kennel and I'd get him away from those um, those spots, those triggers that, that would cause him to do the behavior. And I started to play ball with him. And so I started to think that we were starting to build a relationship. And it looked like it was pretty good. So I was leaving him out the backyard, no leash on, and I'm trying to go in the house, and I'm thinking, okay, this dog wants to come in the house, and I don't want him to go in the house. So all I did was I stuck my leg out, and I said no, and I had the door in my hand, and I said no, and I put my leg out. The next thing I, I hear is this guttural growl, and he goes after my leg, and now he's climbing my body, and, and the fight is on. I and mean, this dog came at me so strong. I never had a dog come at me that hard. And it was just, it was majorly a, a fight. The fight was on, and I, it felt like it would last for an hour, but it was probably only a couple minutes. But So, Mark, let me ask you this. Go ahead. The timing between, right, the dog growling versus the bite was a matter of seconds. Yes. You it don't was. have time to even correct that. No. That's the scariest freaking part of the situation. Yeah. Yes, it was, my heart was in my throat. All I could do was sit there. I was going, arrow, arrow, no, no. And I was trying to block him with the door, and, and the fight was even more and more, and he was coming on me. And then I yep. realized I've got to protect myself, kind of like what would happen with you. And so yep. being around dogs as long as I have, I knew I had to control the head. So what yep. I did was came up underneath the dog's neck and I grabbed that fur underneath that neck and I controlled the head and I pinned him into a corner in this little room that I had. And I pinned him in the corner and I told him, knock it off. And I just held him because I knew if I let go, that dog was going to eat me. And so I, I held him there for a good 30 seconds, a minute, whatever it was, until the dog took his eyes off of my eyes because I was staring him in the eyes. I was dominating him with my attitude. And he finally looked down to the ground. He didn't cow. He just said, you're in control now, is all he told me. So I knew right then that I had control of the situation, but it was still on. So what I did is I, I grabbed him by the collar, and I was all worried in my mind that he was going to flip and come at me some more, and the fight was going to go on. But I, I let's go back to the kennel, and I talked him into it. And the whole way back, he's growling at me. And we get back to the kennel, and I know this dog, his propensities, his behavior loops that he already had, was that he was going to spin on that door. I had no leash on him. What am I going to do? So I got him by the collar and he wants to go into the kennel. That's what he was doing, pulling me back the whole way and growling. And so I looked at the door and I looked at him and I just kind of put it through my mind. I've got to get him into the kennel as far back as I can do it. So I pushed the door, I grabbed him by the ass and the head and I tossed him as far back as I could get him. And he came back at that door and it's a scary thing when you've got a dog coming to that heavy. And no, I, I totally understand. Help me deal with totally understand. With something else. I had... I don't know. I probably had 50 feet that I had to fight this dog. And I thought instantly, I have to get him in the dog room. I have to get him contained. If I don't get him contained, this is going to suck more than anything. You know what I mean? Like, I just, I have to get him contained. Yeah. And then what people don't realize is so after the situation occurred, I called an ambulance. I, I'm bleeding all over the place. Uh, if anybody didn't see my pictures, go look online on my Facebook and scroll down. You'll see them. I posted them. And, uh, most of our audience. That's right. 
I'm bleeding all over the place. And after I put it to go bag with like deodorant and shit like that to bring to the hospital, I was like, I have to call my friends. And I have three of probably the best canine trainers that are civilians I know in New England that are close by. One of them is my really good friend of 10 years, Steve Roberts, Josh Knowlton, and Jared Wolf. All PSA studs. I mean, they, they just kill it. Josh is honestly, I think, preferably the best decoy in the United States. And I'm saying that is real life. So Steve's like, all right, we're coming over. So I'm in the hospital on morphine and fentanyl and everything else. So they come over here. He knows my door code. All three of them in our decoy suit, right? The dog, I said, listen, if you guys can get him out to my indoor outdoor kennel, that's all I need. Like I can handle him from there, but I need you guys to get him out there. And like, all right, all right. An hour later, an hour later, they call me back and Steve's like, dude, I can't get this fucking dog outside. He's like, we've all been trying. There is no way in hell his switch is flipped. He wants to kill us. And he's like, all we could do is get him contained because I had this massive, I don't know, eight by eight, like a massive kennel that's all metal with like, it looks like a tiger cage. You know what I mean? So they're able to get, scare him into there and then shut the doors and then take cable ties and like make sure it's like, no matter what, he's not getting out. Right. And it just goes to show like how insane animals can be. And I got a lot of flack because people, the Dogo Argentino world is, is a very different world. And I got a lot of emails, not a lot, but I got some saying like, you're making the breed look bad and everything else. And what I'm trying to tell people, I'm not trying to make a breed look bad. I'm trying to make families that have seven little kids not buy a freaking breed like that. Exactly. It is not meant for everybody. Exactly. They are strong dogs. It's same shit happens when like a, a, a movie comes out of like Max, who's a Belgian Malinois, or like when the Taliban gets yeah. hurt. Everybody wants to go buy a Belgian Malinois. I'm like, what yeah. the frick are you guys doing? No, go buy your golden doodles and go buy your labs and call it a day. Like, exactly. cut the shit with the working dogs. If the dog isn't going to be working, you can't do it. Well, it's we all try to communicate to the public in general as far as uh, dogs being ruined by the movie industry. I mean, Lassie was one of them. I mean, not Lassie, but Rin Tin Tin. They ruined the shepherd yeah. after Rin Tin Tin, the movie. It was everybody wanted one, and they screwed him up real bad as far as the shepherd back yeah. then. And then we talked the Dobermans about were the 70s, you know. Malinois. Malinois <laughs> the Doberman gang. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now it's Cane Corsos for some reason. That's the new thing. Everybody's getting a Cane Corso. I'm like, guys, they're not easy dogs. You know, I, I the sad thing about it is, you guys, is one somebody messaged me. I had like a thousand messages after I posted that because it went viral. It, it was reposted 3,000 times. Somebody messaged me and I wanted to throw up because the guy's like, hey, I saw your post. I have a dogo. I have a, uh, it was like a 16 month old son and the dogo is now growling at my son. What should I do? And I was like, let me guess. I go, first off, he's not neutered, correct? And he's like, no. How'd you know? And I'm like, that's your first issue. I was like, secondary, what are you doing with this breed with small kids? You obviously don't know anything about the breed. You just literally Googled it. You saw Ray Donovan. You know what I mean? You saw some freaking show and you're like, oh my God, this dog is cool. I get it. They're cool looking dogs. I'm a fan. Like I'm, I'm literally like, that's why I took on this breed because I'm like, all right, they're badass and it's a challenge and I'm a psycho and I love challenges. So I was like, sign me up. Right. This guy, and I was like, I'm telling you right now, give it to a rescue, give it to somebody else that knows what they're doing, buy a golden retriever. Stop it with this your dog. Like you saw what this dog can do to me. Like you have a small child it's growling at. The thing could eat him. Like yeah, I'm exaggerating, but like still it's just the the, the no, possibility it could eat him. it totally could eat him. Mm. You know, so like that's my thing. And a lot of people don't understand that there's nature versus nurture. And with dominance aggression especially, it's both situations, especially with rescue dogs, nature versus nurture. Nature obviously is genetics. And genetics plays such a key component in these dogs. If they're shit breeding, you could possibly have a shit dog. And unfortunately, it is what it is. And a lot of it is psychological, just as it is humans. You know what I mean? You take two humans that are unfortunately genetically not the best people in the world, and all of a sudden they have a kid <laughs> keep them in a crack house, they're gonna end up in a, as a crackhead. You know what I mean? It's just it's it's and then that's the nurture side of it. So it's just you take genetics which is a huge component of a dog, the, the biggest part of it. And then you take the nurturing part, which is the components of the environmentals and what they were upbringing us. Right. You can have a freaking disaster. And all of a sudden everybody's like, hey, can you take, you know, can you take this dog? It's really not that bad. Well, with genetics speaking and in a background like that, it's, it's literally a dangerous weapon, right. you know? 
All right, I want to kind of change subject a little bit and go into the profession as far as when you're dealing with the animal control and, and some of what Ted was talking about as far as waivers and that sort of thing, as far as the step ladder that may happen when it goes through an, an animal control or you get that kind of a situation, Ted. Okay, so we get a lot of dogs in from rescues and uh, animal control, stuff like that. One of the things that they do is they have waivers on, usually a medical waiver or a behavior waiver on the dogs. Um, I, I'll take both. We do rehab for medical rehab for dogs that need attention all day long and then um, in constant care. And then we also take the behavior um, aggression cases that are behavior um, waivers. So um, the way this works is a, a rescue pulls a dog from the shelter and they need it to go to a trainer trainer because the dog is under a waiver. Um, so I get the dog, I work with the dog, I assess the dog, I determine, you know, um, a plan for the dog's training if possible. And I, you know, I share this with the rescue and depending on the rescue, they'll, they'll either have the training done or they'll take the dog back to the shelter or they'll, you know, they have other, or, you know, if the dog doesn't really need training and it was just a, a shy dog that was a little nippy in the beginning, that really is not a problem. Um, we'll, we'll place into a foster, which we evaluate the fosters and we evaluate the homes that they're going into and we make sure that it's the right case. And more than 50% of the time I send the people away because it's not the right situation for the dog. So yeah. my job is to let people know the truth about these dogs because, you know, the sad fact is rescues just don't do that. You know, rescues, um, a lot of cases, times they, they're just trying to find the dogs a home, you know, their heart's in the right place, but their experience isn't. And, you know, I live in California where, you know, we have a lot of liability, you know, and uh, a dog could bite somebody and then that rescue can go out of business and then they can't help anybody. Right. You know, so I really think that a lot of focus needs to be spent on, on the actual dogs that, um, you know, that can be helped and the people who can help the harder cases like Leo or me, or I know a few other trainers that are used to dealing with the, the dominant aggression and, you know, the more serious reactivity, um, I'd like to see, you know, those people doing more um, for the dogs that can't get help. That um, kind of brings me to the, the question that I've got in my mind. As far as the waiver is concerned, has the animal control done any type of assessment that they've written some notes or anything that you can go off of? What kind of case history do you have when you get a dog out of a, a rescue or a, uh, animal regs that you have to go on? So, well... It all depends. Um, depends on the rescue. Some rescues are very adamant about getting detailed assessments from the shelter. Um, and then sometimes they'll provide those to me. I've had some rescues not provide those to me. Dogs with bite history that, you know, they didn't share that the dog had a bite history. And, and I promise you, when I see the aggression come out or Leah sees the aggression or Mark sees the aggression, we're going to know that the aggression is is something that's a learned aggression, something that they've had success with and they're getting away with it over and over. And now this poor dog's being shuffled from people to people instead of just being put with someone to help it. Right. So, you know, and they're hiding the fact that, I guess that the that's other going on. Comes to mind in a big way is the, the background history of the animal. Like Leah's saying, she, a lot of times she doesn't have a background. How important is that? The, the most important thing in my mind you need that background to be able to get a little bit of a head start on where the dog's head's at. So it, it's an important thing. And a lot of times, like I said, Leah, these people don't want to tell you uh, what's happened with the animal. And then, you, like you said, this stuff doesn't come out of nowhere. It's manifesting for a reason. There's some kind of history that causes the dog what I call flash. So it's flashing on something that's in his past. So when your dog was sitting next to that counter, what caused him to all of a sudden flash and go into an attack mode when he's after, there was something that was in his past that he flashed on that causes that behavior. So an association yeah. or an experience. Yeah. Exactly. So there's yeah, so and there's always a trigger. There's always a trigger. Exactly. Something triggers it. Exactly. 
And, so and, times, and there's times that you can literally think about it a hundred times and be like, what the F was it? And sometimes you'll never actually know. And sometimes it could be something that's so obvious right on your nose, you know, but yeah. unfortunately it's one of those things where you just don't know, you know? And like I said before, I've taken on dominance aggression dogs because I've always liked the challenge and I've had great success with them. I mean, I had two Belgian Malinois here. I don't know if you guys knew about the case um, a year ago, last May, there was a 14-year-old boy that was mauled to death by five Dutch Shepherds and Belgian Malinois here in Massachusetts. Grandma was waiting out in the yard and was trying to hold yes. everyone to the neighbor. Yep. That yeah. was pretty horrific. So, Can you tell I us worked with a rescue yeah. and yeah. Animal Control called me and they were like, we don't know what to do with this female Malinois. It was upstairs. It wants to kill us at Animal Control. We're not used to, you know, working dogs. We don't, we, it's a small town town you know and i was like all right i'll come pick her up that's fine and they're like well we have one stipulation I'm like what's that they're like she has nine one deal puppies and i was like all right <laughs> so you know i went and i dealt with her and her and then i took another one from an air control as well that was going to be euthanized because nobody could handle them and they're both in maryland state police canine right now and they're thriving Good. successfully on patrol so, so it turned out a little you know, bit, okay so the, the, yeah, there's what we caught on the news was that a 14 year old boy was in the backyard trying to feed the dogs and he went down in the backyard. So I pictured in my mind being ignorant of what the real situation was that he got mauled by a pack of dogs is the way I took it. But it, no, what, it was what know? happened verbatim is this kid that the owner of the dogs, I have nothing bad to say about him. He's a decoy. He was a French ring person. I've always heard nothing but good things about him. Yeah. I don't yeah. know him personally, but I've, I know the canine world's small. So I, um, what happened was the 14 year old boy, he was in Boston or whatever the owner and the kid would go there to feed the dogs. If he wasn't around, he went to feed the dogs. It was five, three Dutch shepherds and two Belgian Malinois downstairs that he went to feed. They're all out of their crates. I guess he goes to feed them. Nobody knows what happens. Obviously there's no video cameras around, but I assume two of the dogs might've started fighting on food aggression. He tried to break it up pack mentality. They all directed and reverted to him. That's my possible theory. I actually met all the dogs in animal control that were involved that they euthanized because they all had blood DNA trace evidence in their mouth. Right. One of them was an eight month old puppy that was legit the nicest, sweetest female Belgian male puppy in the world. The other ones I was like, uh, but unfortunately she could have went over and licked his body afterwards, you know, and she still had blood yeah. DNA in his mouth. So they all got put down. You swab on the dogs to get, don't determine. So was it a, a broken, broken artery maybe in his leg or somewhere else to get nailed in that? What, the uh, I know people in the medical examiner offices and um, they told me that the it was such a bad mauling that the kid basically had no clothes left in his body and half oh, of yeah. you know, an arm. It, it wasn't good. It no, wasn't good. I mean, you feel for the, the guy that's got the dogs because he was just out of town you know, and, and shit happened. So that's a bummer. Totally. Yeah, I agree. You know, I mean, granted, Personally, I wouldn't have a 14-year-old child coming and letting my dogs out even, and they're no. the nicest dogs. My personal dogs are, are awesome. That seems you know? pretty irresponsible to me. <laughs> it's just too much of a liability, you guys, and I just couldn't do it. You know, it's just one of those things where I'm like, eh, I'll let Steve, that's a good friend of mine, that's a canine guy, let my dogs out. Yeah, this, this kid just wasn't prepared to deal with, um, you know, and I, the deal with the, the possibilities that could happen you know and that's one of the things that i work with my employees on is you know like what are you are you ready for uh for what could happen if it came because you know these are the dogs that we deal with and it's serious it's not um i actually shared your facebook posts with my employees just so that they can you know further understand the the seriousness of the things that they do and wh who they're working with or the dogs that they're working with. Exactly. And that's why I posted it initially because I wanted people to know this can happen. You know what I mean? Like this isn't all rainbows and unicorns and Skittles popping out of everyone's butts and everyone has the perfect dogs. Things can happen. You know, did I get flack on it? And of course we have some trainers that are sitting there picking apart everything I say, like the organic sit and shit like that. I'm like, guys, relax. Like, I'm not doing this to try to be like, I'm a hero. I, no, I'm trying to do it as I obviously messed up some way. You know what I mean? Like I'll, I'm a humble person. I'll wholeheartedly say that, you know, and I just want to educate people and let them know, like, this could happen to you. You know, just be careful, please. That's all I ask. So I'm looking in our comments, guys, and I'm trying to find something that's an actual 
valid question or something that's a little bit more not hijinks. And we've got a couple that are a little bit hijinks about fighting a dog. I like the one that says, how does one not, how does one get qualified to fight a dog? Exactly. That's <laughs> what I saw too. It's like, like come done. on, dude. Exactly. State Police Academy, defensive tactical training. There you go. All right. So here's one. I'll go ahead and put it on the screen and we'll read it. Did you even do a properly do an eval of the dogo you spoke about doing obedience with a dog? What eval did you do? Pressure? You had the dog in your kitchen? Question mark. A lot of questions. Um, so initial eval of the dog. I just I, you don't put pressure on initial eval of any dog. That's just asking. That's like walking up to a stranger and being like, "What's your social security number?" You know what I mean? Like you just you can't you can't do that so it's just you watch the dog's behavior you watch how he reacts you you know obviously food food is a huge tool for anything to do with any anything behavioral anything eval with a new dog you know reward him reward him reward him let him know that you're a friendly person you're not you're not a threat you know this is your house and at the same time don't baby him you know what i mean like i wouldn't baby any dog especially this dogo that i got i was always very firm in commands i wasn't like oh hey like let me kiss your face and shit like that. You can't do that. You know, you have to be strict. You have to be enforcing that you are in charge. You're the alpha, you know, and then you start working with them. You know, it, for example, him eating, I, I would put the bowl down. I put him in a sit. He only eats when I tell him, when I give him the, the, the key word, when I give him the okay, the release command, then you can eat. And then we started working on stuff where he's in the middle of eating and I give him the sit command, you know, and he'd sit and, and he'd actually look at me and be like, all right, you know, and that's things to assert just to show it with obedience, like, okay, obedience isn't going to change any behavioral issue, but if there's no behavioral issues that you see, then you're going to start working on obedience. You tracking? Yeah. Bottom line, you, you ask for behaviors and, you, and everything in his world at that point, when you're dealing with an aggressive situation, comes from you. Yep. So we'll use things like deprivation, putting him in a kennel and leaving him there so he wants your attention, wants somebody around. Uh, basically depriving food a little bit, bring up hunger, that's going to work for you. There's all kinds of little tricks that we can use. Uh, yep. for, those are a couple of the more well-known ones. But asking for behaviors, and that's what I did with the dog, with the uh, Dutch Shepherd about, about back. We've got a great relationship now, but it's all based on you give me what I want and I give you what you want. When you give me behaviors, yep. I throw you the ball. You know? yep. that's kind of positive really reward. Cool. It's positive. It's positive rewarding, gratification rewarding, no matter what. You know, and then obviously, like, I'd put the muzzle on him and I'd push him a little bit and see if there was any issues. Right. You know, we have a toy, so I'd put the muzzle on him, I'd throw a toy, he'd start trying to play with the toy with his muzzle on, I'd take away the toy. Okay, there's no there's no resource guarding there. You know, take away his food with the muzzle on. You know, he couldn't eat the food, but just things like that to show and try to push him just to create some sort of uncomfortable situation to see if he's going to actually react. Right. You know? He didn't react in anything. He had creative aggression. Where the dog's head's at? Where's the dog's head at? So you're yeah. when you're going through the work. And the, the muzzle is a safety aspect of that because you're not going to be that stupid that you do it without a muzzle and you don't know the dog and you don't have the dog to that level. You know? Dude, I got this dog with a serious ear infection. I called my vet. And obviously with COVID, you have to like go in your car and then they come out and they take the dog. And I'm like, hey, I have a muzzle. They're like, why do you have a muzzle? I'm like, because I just got this dog. He's brand new. I don't know if he's going to be aggressive. Like, I'm trying to help you guys out. He's fine with a muzzle on. He's not going to be a big deal. And they're like, oh, my God, thank you so much. I'm like, why would you not want me to muzzle this dog that's unknown? You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's a safety right. aspect. Um, here's a person's question, and we'll go ahead and take it. How do you deal with dominant aggression on a puppy? And, and there I, I kind of right away think that the person might not be that uh, familiar with dog behavior. A puppy showing dominant aggression he might test you, but he's really not going to be showing a true dominant aggression. But that's my reply. What would you think, Leah? I'm sorry. Is that near Ted? Ted? How do you deal with dominant aggression in a puppy? I think it's a kind of a misplaced uh, question in that regards because I can't really see a, a, a real true dominance coming from a puppy. Testing, maybe, but dominance is a whole different thing when they're trying to really assert their dominance with an attack. That usually is a little bit higher in the maturity in the animal. But, uh. I, I, I've seen, you know, some, some dominant behaviors in puppies. Um, typically, the way that I'll deal with this is I'll bring an, an, a group of dogs into the equation 
and I'll work the aggression um, through some kind of a the dog learning respect for bigger and older dogs around them. Um, I have a pack of dogs that I've been doing this with for years, and slowly I've put together a very nice balanced pack for this. Um, but you know, basically, it's just boundaries. The the puppy needs to learn some boundaries. You need to be serious about it. You you can't be, you know. Um, picking the dog up and carrying him around if he's being having having dominant behavior with you you know treat the dog like a dog and typically you'll get the behavior you're looking for um you know you it's just fair you know dogs are just wanting us to be fair to them i think typically. a lot of times as a professional trainer we see the same things again and again from human behavior and ignorance and lack of knowledge on their part and how they treat their dogs and how this causes a lot of these problems uh, one of those problems, like I said, over coddling the dog, you know, uh, it would cause a lot of problems. Dogs have a totally different psychological makeup and how you should treat them and, and build your relationship. Right. Cindy, manipulus, Cindy. Cindy. Got I like, I like this comment from Blake Freeman. Um, you know, one of your biggest mistakes is uh, working with the dog by yourself. Um, this is something that we have to do from time to time. Yep. Um, but I agree. Um, you know, when I have not three weeks into having the dog, I don't have a second person um, opposite me. But I've, often when I have a dog get dropped off, I have the owner put two lines on the dog. I'm on one side, my one of my employees um, is on the other side, one of the other trainers here, and we manage the dog so the dog can't get in between us. You know, we have a cool down period for these dogs. Um, it's just, uh, you know, to keep yourself safe, I agree, like having a second person, but, you know, it's not always an option. And, you know, three weeks into it, you feel like you've, you've accomplished something. You're seeing good behaviors out of the dogs. You haven't been seeing anything going wrong. So you, you start to get comfortable with it. And I think that I'm the same way. Mark's probably the same way. You know, it's, it's just a, it's the way the progression happens. You know, we're, we want these dogs to get better and go back out into the world. So exactly. in our minds, you know, we're, we're seeing the small successes and we're, we're trying to enjoy them and, you know, work them where, you know, we're having those successes and the dogs are like, you know, getting more freedoms because they're, having those successes you know 100 percent, 100 percent. that's like there's this broad in the chat right now and she's trying to say like how do you know things are 17 uh, years this I'm, like, I'm, like, something. I'm, myself. I'm trying to decipher what's a good one to pull in from her and she's able so to this is this is what i laugh at and people don't understand and if anyone thinks differently they're wrong people as trainers are always consistently learning things every friggin day no. i've been doing this for almost 20 years I know about 35 fucking percent of what I should know, okay? Most people are learning every day. You learn from mistakes, you learn from your success. Right. No matter what the case is, you're gonna learn from it, regardless what the situation is. And people don't understand that. A lot of people just think like, oh, this person knows everything and this and that. I'm the most humble person in the world. I know when I something happens and I'm in the wrong. That's why I humbly posted all this stuff because I'm like, I'm going to get so much shit for this and I don't care because I'm going to help so many other people realize that this can happen. Somebody could die. There's a, there's serious situations. And as we spoke about before, there's a lot of trainers out there who go and put a decoy suit on for two years at somebody's, you know, training facility. And all of a sudden they're a master trainer. You know what I mean, it's like, I call them poke the trainers, poke the other trainer, the hand of shingle up and now they're an expert. Yep. Agreed. Like Mike Ritland is a friend of mine. Mike Ritland still tells me this day. I'm still learning stuff. The dude knows more than most people I know. I will sit there and, and I'll, I'll talk to him for two hours on the phone and, and I'm mind blown of this, the information he gives me, but he still tells me, Leah, I'm still learning things. You know, it just goes to you know, such that. You everything, you are ultimately wrong and you obviously get to have like a different mindset. Some you know, so. young lady that seems to think that we said some statement of smell the fear of death. I don't understand where she came up with that one, but that's I don't remember saying. Oh that. yeah, this person has said it seventeen times. All I meant is if you walk in a New York, New York Animal Control, for example, it smells like absolute complete shit. 
There is no way in hell those dogs cannot smell those dogs getting euthanized. Well, they, sense, they sense the fear. They sense the environment. Exactly. 100%. 100%. Yeah. And that makes them react in a different way behaviorally because they're in an uncomfortable place. It's like if you go to boot camp in the Marines. You know what I mean? Like, you're not going to act normally like you're hanging out with your friends at dinner drinking wine. You know, it's just, it's a whole different environment and it's a whole different way that the dogs can react differently for that reason. Exactly. I've got one question here from one of my uh, audience members that watches my videos all the time. Turn V, turn Veer Manuel. I think he's over in the UK. He's on the other side of the pond. Ted Mark, what are the first stages of building a bond with a rank dominant aggressive dog? Ted, I'll go ahead and let you have that. Um, so every dog is different. Um, I've, I've done things like, uh, you know, just feeding the dog out of my hands, just trying to build a, a relationship through food because it can speed it up sometimes. Um, other dogs I've, you know, gotten into little wrestling matches with, put a muzzle on them and actually let them come after me and gotten in little wrestling matches with them. So just to uh, take away his mouth and then, then he understands that you've got the control over him and Exactly. Yeah, and you know, I used to I used to be against using muzzles a lot because I I thought you know what are we solving when the dog's in a muzzle, um, but I learned that there's steps we can take, um, you know, and keep ourselves and our dogs safe if we're using a pack of dogs or we're doing stuff ourselves. Um, this dog, for instance, that I adopted, that's in my backyard, that. You know, I, I took to the vet and just went after the vet. Luckily, it was in a muzzle. Um, you know, went after its prior owner, went out. Like, it was, the dog's just gone after a ton of people prior to even being in my care. Um, so I, I took the dog on, and, you know, I heard, you know, three and a half months on a catch pole. Like, what do you do with that dog? And exactly. so I put the muzzle on the dog, and I said, all right, well, come on you know and me and the dog got into it a little bit and like within 24 hours like a few sessions of the dog coming after me me and the dog were best friends you know and it's not the approach that i typically take with a dog but you know those normal approaches weren't working with this dog with other trainers so i had to think outside the box initially so you know what i do is i i assess the dog i determine you know, if any information I can get prior on the dog, I use that to, to determine the best route. Um, every dog's different, a little different, but what every dog wants is they want fairness. Okay. They want, every dog wants a good leader. I don't care if it's a dominant dog or not. It's looking for a leader. Okay. And every dog wants us to be fair to them. And if we're not fair, then the nicest dog will bite you. Right. I don't care. You know, yeah. it's just so f number one, you know, if you're dealing with a dog with that problem, be fair to the dog, you know, give him the chance to yield to the 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 issues you're having rather than, you know, um, being so abrasive to addressing the issues that the dog is just can't think clearly during the during the change. Yeah. Yeah, that, that brings to mind how you have to be creative. You know, I was trying to get a little nine-week-old puppy to down, a little uh, wine runner, high-drive field dog. You know, I bought him from a good field dog and training. and couldn't get the dog to down. So I put my body over the top of the dog and had my lure and was just coaching the dog into a down, finding the dog. Well, we've been trying to get the dog down for a week. You try to struggle him and, you know, place him into a down with physically. The dog's going to struggle with it. But there's a good example. You've got to be creative and think outside of the box a lot of times to protect that animal. So, hundred percent. Yeah. yeah, and then that comes from skill. It comes from understanding dog psychology and behavior that you can feel it. As I call it the gut feeling of dog training. You actually feel this when you're working with an animal, and that's getting in tune with the animals. When they first come in, you don't know the dog. Spend some time, build that bond, and you start to get a feel for the animal, and then you can start making. Uh, decisions on what you're going to do with the animal. So. And that's the thing a lot of people forget is you have to establish a bond before you can start giving corrections, okay. especially physical ones. I don't care if it's a nylon collar, if it's a martingale, like exactly. don't do freaking collars, don't do prongs. Just just make the establish the bond. Feed him by hand, him or her by hand. Just 
make it so they know that, that you are the comfort zone. You know what I mean? Like you are the person that they are going to, you're the person that their world revolves around. You're the source of food. You're just That's those situations. That's the way most canine handlers handle dogs with aggression. So even when they come over from Germany, you've got a dog that's real stout. Uh, Europe, wherever it may be, KNVP dogs, they're really stout dogs. And so a lot of times when you get a dog like that, you right away put them in a kennel and everything comes from you. And they have, you know, a lot of times we can put a tarp around the kennel where they have no sensory at all. And you yep. rock with that. And then you start from there. And the only thing they see, everything comes from you. And that's yep. a lot of times it will deal with an aggressive dog and aggression problems. So. No, for sure. I mean, it's just even with canines, it's it's the same scenario. It's you, you have to, we would take them home for two weeks and they're like, what, people would be like, what do you want us to do with a dog? And we're just like, you have to go home and just bond with your dog. For literally let two weeks. Let them be a dog. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Let them know that the food's coming from you. And if you don't, you know, same with detection dogs. There was times they don't want to work. They wouldn't get fed for a day. Sometimes two days I saw in, in schools that they were just like, it's not you're not going to show it, then this is what you do. And you get fed during the training. And some people would say it's it's absolutely awful to do to, to dogs. And realistically, it's not. It's just showing them that they're going to conquer and divide. They're going to obtain their food source from you when they do exactly. what we want them to do. You know? A lot of that type of an attitude comes from the layman that don't understand dog psychology and dealing with the canines and the, the stature of dogs that we deal with. You know, it's, it's a different thing altogether. Mm -hmm. And they right away want to label you as being cruel and inhumane. Um, trying to find this one and turn his comment off. Um, I can't think of anything else right off the top of my head, guys, but I'm sure that we can use this show to, to spin off of and maybe get into some more in-depth subjects maybe on the next show that we have or when we do another show towards dog and uh, I appreciate you guys coming on the show. and It's been a, a great thing to have because it, it allows me to hear your comments and, and other professionals that are giving feedback. And that's like you said, yeah, that's how we learn. And that's one of the reasons I do these shows because we can all learn and grow. Even from these comments, I'm looking for something that's good because even when somebody doesn't know something, they can say it and perspective may be totally different and it may get you to clue in. Because I really feel that we all have kind of blinders on. I go through my world and I only see what's on my side of the fishbowl. So it's really important to have somebody outside that fishbowl be able to give feedback and things, and that's what this show is all about. Uh, and that's the biggest, that's the best part, is learning, learning, learning. Uh, We're always learning. There's always something different. If you go to any, like, the canine shows, you know, in Vegas or anything else, it's just there's always some new sort of thing that you're implementing into training. You know, there's always some, the clickers, and all of a sudden the clickers are bad, and then, you know, the mark word, the mark word's better than the clicker. And it's just, there's so many different things. It never it's stops just, evolving, Leah, it never stops. It's always going to be changing and flexing and growing. And, uh, let's see here, I'm trying to exactly. find a good question. Exactly. I think we're going to go ahead and sign off. We're in an hour and 12 minutes, if that's good for you. If you've got something you want to say before we end the show, you're more than welcome to. Um, all I want to say too, is there's one other thing that I got a lot of flack for. A lot of people said, they're like, well, People actually said this to me message or, or wrote in comments that I'm too small of a person to train dogs that big. I'm like, okay, so are you also going to say that I'm too small of a person when I was a state trooper that I shouldn't have been a cop? Like, it does nothing. One of the greatest canine handlers I know in Massachusetts is this girl named Nicole Tran. She's literally 96 pounds. She has a Dutch Shepherd that she's titling in PSA. I think it's going to be her PSA 2 title. The dog is absolutely insane. Crushes bites, amazing obedience. This girl's literally this big, and she's like, I don't know, five feet. You know, the dog's have, have big. Have you ever <laughs> seen a Chihuahua boss around a big breed? Yes. <laughs> yes. I see it all the time. Okay, and the whole thing is, is like some of the trainers that I know are very small. I mean, I can think of a handful of national level competitors and decoys that you know, or five, six, five, seven, little, little guys that are, and women that are, that are not, um, you know, huge, but the Chihuahua shows us, I've seen Chihuahuas chase off dogs 10 times their size and the dogs are freaking out and you got this little Chihuahua like, yeah, this is my block, you know? You and, know another good example is when the big hawk goes near the nests of like the pigeons or like the smaller birds or like the, the friggin' cardinals like the small 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 birds and the little birds are like hell no and just go after them and that the hawk flies away 
you know. All right, so. we're going to end this. I want to thank the audience for coming to watch, and we're going to be doing more of these shows. We're going to do a little more graphics, a bunch of bells and whistles I'm going to be putting in. But before I leave, I want to put this gentleman's comment in here because it kind of peeves me, and I want to have a little discussion with him on a roundabout way. Good boy. Just because you've been doing dog training for 17 years doesn't mean you did it correctly. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you, Blake, if you're still on the show, but reality is that no dog trainer that's out there that's dealing with any stock dogs, canines, working dogs like we deal with is can ever say that he hasn't been bit. Okay. We all have it where we do get bit. It happens. And it's it's about um, learning from your mistakes. And I know that, that uh, Leah is going back and analyzing this a thousand, thousand different times because she's like me. You learn from when things happen and things should happen. She didn't know that dog was going to come at her. She was building a relationship. Same thing with that Dutch Shepherd I had in the backyard that I've got now, and I've got a really good relationship with him now. I was trying to build a relationship, and I tried to tell the dog no, and boom, before I knew it, the dog was on me. Sometimes you don't have any uh, ability to uh, know that this stuff is going to happen, and you can't keep total control. So the bottom line is I think you're full of shit, to be honest with you. Well, yeah. let's, let's talk about his question just for a sec, okay? Yeah. Because – there's a little bit of it that makes sense, okay? And it's not talking about her specifically, but there's a lot of trainers out there that have been around for 20 years that don't know what the hell they're doing. They just don't, okay? Yeah. So it's like, just because a trainer has been doing it for a long time, doesn't mean they understand what they're talking about. Now, in Leah's case, she's been dealing with working dogs. She's been dealing with aggression. She's been dealing with this stuff for a long period of time. So I think that as far as anybody's concerned, Leah knows what she's doing and she's a professional in this field, exactly. you know, but there are a lot of people that they've worked out of the back of their car. You know, they've, they've just been teaching sit down and come for 20 years. And how does it make it, how does it make it so that they can do behavior? It, it, I don't understand because in my world, in the way that I think about dog training is obedience and behavior are opposite ends of the spectrum. Agreed. Okay, and, and so like we have a lot of people that will approach behavior work through obedience because they don't know anything better because they're not growing their education and they're not learning how to address the things properly. Like when I work aggression, I don't use corrective devices at all. Okay, and I have great success with my with the aggression, you know, and so it's not a major part of my advertising because you know i like getting the foo foo dogs too so and if i if i advertise that i do aggression sometimes i just don't get those dogs you know but i like i have a whole staff that's you know designed around doing obedience training and stuff like that as well so you know i i think that if you separate those things and you address the behavior for what it is you're doing it correctly. If you address behavior through obedience, like making the dog sit and thinking that you have a dog that's under control because he's sitting there for you, the second something's more valuable to that dog than what you've used to reinforce that behavior, the right. dog's gone. Yeah, yeah. You know? That well, cat is history. It's that it's little a dog's purely history. positive crowd that a lot of times have no concept of dealing with the world that we deal with. Not that they're bad. I mean, the science of dog training is science. It's great. I learn a lot from them. You know, it's a great thing. But they really don't have any concept when it comes to working with this type of a stature of the dog. Uh, yeah, you know. absolutely. Oh, I agree so too. the question was valid, but you know. Well, I think he was a little bit aggressive with his attitude, which was, was irritating me because he's. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> we'll let it go. Blake, I'll apologize. Yeah, I'm sorry, this buddy, is, this but, is for uh, the haters. Uh, like, I literally... I, I, All right, so we're going to end this. Easy. Folks, I should start this out at the beginning of the show, but hit the bell. Subscribe. We're going to be doing more of these. Thank you very much for coming, Ted. Thank you. Leah, thank you guys so much. Was you're great. welcome. I, I, I look forward to you getting better quick and going out and doing your thing with some more dogs, girl. Almost there. Almost there. Thanks, guys. There awesome. Talk to you guys soon. Thanks very thank much. You. Bye, Bye, everybody. Bye.